Preparing to delve in three, two, one. All right, so the follow-up I have to our discussion on cover is what you're supposed to do when a mechanic doesn't really seem to work anymore and how you might mitigate it or change it around. I have noticed this from just playing Dungeons and Dragons. It feels like if you go through that book, there's a whole bunch of stuff in there that doesn't really come up at all in in like a, well, like well, one cover of course, but also like when you're doing spell casting that there are physical ingredients that you need to have in order to do spell casting and and all of that. You need to like have a a, a bit of wool or a, a dried carrot or something to cast certain spells. I've never really encountered people using that uh for the most part um, typically with the material components for that stuff a, a lot of people i want to say hand weave it mm -hmm. if it's cheap materials that don't cost a lot that are fairly common usually the ones that they pay attention to are the expensive materials like uh, a diamond worth at least a thousand gold for a resurrection spell for instance mm -hmm. what we kind of assume with a lot of spell casters is that they just have a pouch that has necessary ingredients for it that they would normally have, and maybe they replenish it when they get to, you know, a, a, a store or something like that. But that in general, you just assume, like, they have the equipment for it, that they keep it stocked so they can do it. Um, or it just gets uh, eliminated completely. Uh, what was one of the other ones? Like, um, oh, uh, Tremor Sense. That was okay. another one. Like, I don't usually think of that being utilized very much, even though I've wound up in scenarios where I was like, hmm, when I, I had to deal with ang kegs, that might have been useful. I'm going down in tunnels, giant bugs, that would have been useful, but I never really saw it used at all, and, and I don't know how often stuff like that really comes up. Well, that's kind of like blind sense and stuff. Those things mm. are very situational. Tremor sense would be used for like an ang keg with it, would be mm. able to sense anyone moving around it on the surface. Mm -hmm. um, I believe they're burrowing creatures as well, so they could sense anyone walking over where they are. Mm -hmm. um, but that kind of stuff, Tremor Sense, for instance, is good if you're setting up an ambush or you're setting up um, a place where an ambush could happen or a trap, for instance, because suddenly you've got the party walking in this area that these creatures that have Tremor Sense, and suddenly it's like, all right, well, if the party... Mm -hmm doesn't know that the creatures are there, they're not going to be walking lightly, you know, right. most likely. Right. So it'll be a, a passive check on the creature's part or a passive stealth move silently type check on the player's part. Uh, it might be a hidden rule, for instance. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But I don't know that people really set that up that way. But right. it could be a great way to use that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I mean, those were those those are uh, like you were saying, very situational. But if we were looking at something that might be more fundamental to the game, uh, cover is one of them in terms of uh, the origins of it. But if we were to go back in time to like the the origins of D and D, you know, like chainmail or something like that, where it really was war gaming more or less. There's a lot of systems in there that you just don't see very much of, even though they might just kind of be buried in the back uh, yeah. about, you know, uh, distance and, you know, sight lines and, and a whole lot of that. It might it might technically be in there, but you don't usually see it brought up or analyzed in any great degree now in the right. current iteration. Um, so I guess what I'm I'm just wondering is your general thoughts on... What happens when a system like that no longer seems relevant to the game? Would you um, want to move away from it completely, or would you want to revamp it? I think a little bit of both might work in some cases, where like, you can't really totally get away from the cover mechanic, for instance, in D&D, &D, mm. because once you take it out, then you've got no rules for it. And once you have no rules for it, people arbitrate them as they will. Mm. Um, and that's not always a problem, but it then becomes a, 
there are no rules for this situation. So it becomes the DM and players need to educate for what they think the best course scenario is. Mm -hmm. And if you want to have a specific type of outcome for your game, you need to have some sort of outline for what happens in a situation because you want to account for it. Otherwise, it is just down to what the players and the dungeon master dictate. Right. It's so like it could be you're behind a door uh -huh. and the door takes all the damage and you take no damage and people can't see you or even fire at you. And it's like you can abuse that, obviously. You could just carry around a door with you, for instance. Mm hmm. Mm -hmm. It's like, I'm behind a door. It's like, it doesn't function like that. Now you've just got a shield, and then people will argue. <laughs> Actually, that's a shield. That's not, that's not a cover. So you have that system going in. But it did get me to uh, thinking, too, like, I was uh, playing Skyrim again because I'm stupid. I, I thought that that would be a good use of my time. But it did get me to thinking that in older, I don't know if you remember this, but, like, in older Elder Scrolls games, you really did have, like, a stat block with, like, you know, your strength and perception and luck and, and all of those. And I, I kind of forgot that in Skyrim, you don't really have that. Like, you just have your your three basic uh, stats of, like, your, your stamina, health, and, and magicka, yeah. and then everything else is based on the different um, skill trees for, the, for, for your different abilities. They, they actually completely overhaul the system, but you still kind of know how strong you are, even though yeah. that's not really a, a thing. But I still can't, I can't, like, pick up a horse cart or anything like that. Right. <laughs> I can't do that. Well, uh, and then in games like Skyrim as well, there's not really a cover mechanic in Skyrim. No. But if you hide behind a solid object, then nothing is going to get through that. Right. It's it, There is no real system in place, but the way the game world is built, you could utilize the world that way. But again, just like you were talking in Warhammer, uh, if I'm a melee build... Uh, that cover is really not going to help me very much because I can't attack. Then even in, in uh, Warhammer, for instance, as well, you have weapons that just ignore cover, like flamethrowers. I'm pretty sure Dragon Shout will probably go through cover. Um, <laughs> it, in game or just it, in general? Both. I mean, if you have the power of a Dragon Shout, I'm pretty sure that the flimsy door that you're hiding behind that you're carrying around because it's situational... <laughs> is not going to help you out of that. If you get if you get knocked straight down and prone, it's probably not going to do much for you. So, okay, you can't necessarily strip the mechanic out completely, but you need to keep it around because if you end up in a situation where you might need it, it's good to know what the rules are for it. Right. It's similar to like item hardness and item hit points in D&D, for instance, where mm. technically items have, or objects of all kinds, have a set amount of hit points based on their material and their size and their thickness, for instance. Um, but you don't see it really used a whole lot. No. And you only see them used when it comes up. Like, what if you're carrying around a straw bed in front of you and someone yeah. stabs it? Well, based on the material, based on how thick it is, you know. Does it just kind of fall apart? Does it take the damage and you can't get through it? Do you just pierce it? You know, etc. Sure. There's a lot of that type of stuff. And a lot of it doesn't come into play mm -hmm. a lot of the time. Like, when's the last time you had, a, had someone go, oh, cool, I want to see how many hit points that shield has? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. That usually doesn't uh, become a conversation that you have. Um, I get it because hit points you usually don't think associated with objects even though they were, depending on what version you were looking at right. or what game you're playing. Because um, technically, I think that like my shield in the 1879 game, I think technically it has so much damage that it, it itself can have done to it before right. it fails. Right, which is a durability thing. Right. And that, again, is something you don't see in a lot of tabletop games, partially because it's a lot of bookkeeping at that point. Um, it's not right. really fun, and it's it's I think something that has definitely existed beforehand. I'm sure, but oh, I'm, yeah. I'm sure just the how fun it is versus how consuming it is to deal with that 
is not a good balance. So I'm pretty sure it's just we've moved away from doing that in tabletop. Right, and I, I feel like it's not even just in tabletop because it gets me to thinking about... Remember in the older Fallout game? Well, I say older, not the oldest Fallout games, but in like 3 and in New Vegas where they had item degradation? Because yes. over the course of time, you get hit and stuff, and so your your armor rating keeps declining, and your your weapons, same thing, they degrade, and you have to repair them and everything. When they got to four, they were like, maybe we should just take that out, <laughs> because people don't seem to like it very much. And it's like, yeah, because I'm constantly trying to figure out how to repair my damn armor and weapons all the time. Right. I didn't want to do that. Then 76 came around, and they were like, let's put it back in. Um, <laughs> is it a fun mechanic though no all right then i'm straight out saying that armor degradation weapon degradation are not fun just like i don't like the mechanic of like food spoiling right and and that comes into play in like survival games that mm -hmm. makes sense where it's not just a mechanic to be a mechanic it's a mechanic because it fits a thematic setting right. where you need to make sure you've got food that won't go bad then again, it becomes more bookkeeping on what food is at what percentage of being spoiled. Right. And you have to prioritize that. So it's a lot of bookkeeping and, and uh, managing that as a resource management thing as well. Yeah. And in a lot of like RPGs, they're not a, really about resource management so much. Mm -hmm. I mean, spell casting is kind of a resource management thing. Right. Hit points technically are a resource management thing you don't really resource you manage them the same way you do other things like you have to right. manage and keep an eye on them sure. so it, it becomes the is this worth having in the setting thematically yeah and is it anything that adds anything of value to the game and especially with things where there's a lot of number crunching involved, which you can do in a video game behind the scenes, but you really can't do in a tabletop game because you got to do it in front of people. Um, it, it just becomes a labor that you really didn't want to have to deal with. And when I start thinking about the origins of uh, RPGs and that whole wargaming thing, when you get into the actual RPG setting where you're building this larger world and you have a lot more individual character development and you're really playing for different reasons, it, it, it's just different from a playstyle. All of those things that you were doing in like the old wargaming, a lot of that just doesn't function very well anymore. And right. uh, that's, that's the reason why you have to mitigate it. But again, can't totally get away from it. The, the one that came up not too long ago, I remember people were talking about it when they were uh, talking about the Artificer class that was coming out. And that the Artificer in earlier editions had a lot of, to do with item attunement, because that's how magic worked for them. Right. And, and, but, but that since item attunement wasn't really a big part of, like, 5e, they didn't really know if this was, like, a, a mechanic that they were going to have to reintroduce just so that Artificers made sense. Right. Then you need to reintroduce a mechanic to make something else that you want to work, work which means you're right. basing, in this case, the artificer around a mechanic that you have to reinstitute in order for that even to make sense. Instead right. of, say, revamping how the artificer works in that regard and making it work with existing mechanics. Right. I could have seen them totally just do that, but I can tell you from looking at the D&D &D Beyond character sheets that there is a whole section for item attunement, so... Apparently, that is something that is, is in the game. I don't know if that's necessarily because of the Artificer, but it is definitely still a mechanic that's around. Whether you'll use it for most character builds is not the point. 5e is very magic item light in general, so... Yeah, so um, much of it has to do with just your character leveling up and gaining abilities and, and such. Right. Yeah. Which is... Which is really strange honestly i mean i like mm -hmm. that but i also people like powerful items so i mean i like to uh stumble upon some powerful items that are probably going to get me killed do you know that yeah much? Yeah. yeah silver yeah. swords and all that good stuff those scimitars are great anyway yeah. uh, you know what's interesting though i was talking to somebody who was a, a long time gamer uh and has played D D for a long time and um she said that the thing that she did not like about D&D &D 5e 
was actually that there wasn't enough customization for your character when you do leveling up that it was it was streamlined too much and i've i think i've heard that argument before from people about 5e versus back from 3.5 mm. for instance because yeah. 3.5 there was full customization because you could put skill points into whatever you wanted and you right. could get a feat every third level mm-hmm. uh and they did streamline it in a lot of good ways like the skill points are so much easier to deal with yeah. um and you can't necessarily customize them as much but mm-hmm. you can customize it from the beginning so you're st- you, the, i think the issue people have with it is that once you decide your path of your character it's kind of hard to grow in other ways right so, I mean, you still get, like, you pick your, your class and your archetype, yeah. and then you go down that path, and you can't really go back through into the other archetype. So you still get some choices at those levels on what you want to do, but you're kind of locked into that path. Right. And I think that's what people don't like, because mm-hmm. they're so used to, like, from 3.5, I don't know how 4 he was, I assume it, was, it wasn't quite as strict, um, but they're so used to being able to be like, yeah, well, I am a druid, and I kind of want to go this way with these feats and these skill focuses instead now and there's still feats in 5e but they're not compulsory and you have to trade off for them yes you do and they're not always super great in comparison to getting like the skill bonuses right stat bonuses but some of the feats are really powerful as well so the Mm trade-off is occasionally worth it past level two or three where you choose a subclass essentially yeah. you you choose a vocation there's not there's not really a lot of levels where you have to make any decisions at all sometimes you you don't make any decisions whatsoever they just tell you like uh yep you get this now i guess i could do that now cool and you and you move on and for me as a relatively new player though uh i i'm fine with that as uh you know saying like hey we're we're going to make it so that it's super easy to level up and you just you get this thing it's sort of like the difference between like a diablo 2 and a diablo 3 yeah you know and which is ironic cuz i like diablo 2 a lot more than 3 but and i think a lot of people would agree with that um and i've had many discussions about this especially with like the people that i play martyr with as well and uh, the thing there is that for Martyr, it's all about passive skill customization, which is something that Diablo 2 had. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's all about your passives for how you build, and then your weapons and your armor enchantments and your your rune words, as it were, for that game. So it's a very Diablo 2-esque game mm-hmm. uh, in that end. And people like that, and it makes a lot of things uh, more viable and open and possible because you're not locked in to say what Diablo 3 did which was you're locked into your sets and your legendaries to build around those. Because yeah. each of your abilities only has so many runes you can do. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And so instead of being super customizable, it is limited customization options that you have to bound within. Um, right, right. Cause in, and in, so that, that's the whole thing. At Di- in Diablo 3, literally, you don't, you don't make any choices on level up until you get to like Paragon levels. You make choices in what skill you're using and what rune it has. Yeah. And then you make, um, you make choices on what armor and weapons and items you use. Right. But you, ev- ev- like, for every demon hunter gets every skill. Like, yeah. you, you unlock every skill. Right. At, there, there yeah. is no demon hunter that knows a skill that another demon hunter does not know. Right. Yeah. Which that's, isn't that's inherently bad, mm-hmm. but it means that you all have the same potential. That's kind of a trade-off, too, because on the one hand, you don't get to really uh, build out your character in a specific way that's unique, but on the other hand, it allows you to experiment with a lot of different things um, so that you can uh, see what works best for you. And if you're not familiar with that character class, I suppose that's a really you know beneficial thing. Uh, and then I, I guess at later levels, I suppose you you can then just try to emphasize certain abilities over other ones and try to you know guide your character in that direction. But it's not as locked in as the skill trees were in two, 
where you could literally, or even in like a Borderlands where they also have the three skill trees and you can build different builds depending on what character you have. So my Moe's is not going to be like your Moe's. So I guess in that particular case, it feels like a mechanic that they determined had to go away because they were building it in a new way, but that I would have preferred they they didn't. <laughs> Because they kind of eliminated that altogether. The skill trees were just gone altogether by three. That kind of actually brings me back to the point that you were making before about like, like not ditching a system completely. Yeah. Uh, because, well, for, for that, that kind of very similar reason, the idea that if I have different skill trees and then you just omit the system altogether, it, you know, people might have... One, you either have to try and introduce it or keep it in one way, or you have to replace it with something else that's going to accomplish the same basic thing. So I guess in Diablo 3, they kind of did that, but without the, the skill trees per se. They just they just gave you everything. And in a, a version 5, like in 5th edition, uh, every monk is going to get certain things at certain levels, which is is fine but in earlier editions you might have been able to customize it at every step of the way i guess that the, it, it's still the basic mechanics are there but it's implemented in a completely different fashion so if you were to take a look at it in terms of taking a mechanic that isn't working in a system and i suppose cover is probably the best one that we've come up with in this regard um would you prefer to try to de-emphasize it or would you prefer to accentuate it like we were talking about in the previous uh, episode uh the idea of like maybe maybe revitalize it make it something new maybe yeah i want item attunement sure why not let's make it something like let's make it a pinnacle let's make it like a highlight you know a talking point or just ditch it i i think i'd rather try to emphasize it maybe okay maybe. I tried to make it something that was, like, more in line with the rest of the game. You'd want to salvage it. Yeah. If it's got to be in there, then you want to salvage it to make it something that's got a point to be in there. Right. There you go, folks. I guess, uh, make Tremor sense, like, a main mechanic of the game. Yeah, then we're just playing Dune. Yeah, it's Dune the RPG. I'm sure that exists. It is. I'm pretty sure, like, if I were to look it up now, I could pretty much tell you that Dune is an RPG. They must have made a version of it. It's, uh, it's I'm sure it was 800 pages long. Yep, it probably was, because they wanted it to be inaccurate to the literata. <laughs> there is a certain page limit on books for me, and I think it's after, like, 300, where I'm like, mm, I don't think I can do it. <laughs> it's the reason why I can't do War and Peace. It's the reason why I can't do the Silmarillion. Yeah, you don't. You said you don't read much, anyways, though. So that's fine. I don't read much anyway. I am still, after like a couple years, trying to finish Color of Magic. So, gives you an idea. And that's not a long book, folks. Just for the record, man, it would be cool if, though, just from my limited experience, if there was like a Discworld RPG. I'll have to look it up and see if that's a thing. It probably is. If anybody knows about a Discworld RPG. Uh, where I can play as a character similar to Two Flower. No, no, no. I want to play a character similar to Death. There you go. Yep, that would be great. Yeah. Uh, let me know. If uh, folks wanted to find out about the lost mechanic of delving, where could they go? Into your nearest cave system. Yep. Or you can find us at www.delvecast.com. Yep, you can find everything that we do over there, uh, videos that I make, uh, other podcasts, other experiments that we've been working on, uh, articles, whole thing. Uh, and while you're there, hey, maybe uh, go on and check our Patreon, because we do do some exclusive content over there. Right now, as we are uh, doing this episode, this month, we actually have all four parts of Tales of the Mirror Stone being released over on our Patreon. Yes. Uh, Fantastic. It is, yes, absolutely. If you are a patron, you would have access to all of those as soon as uh, I, I put them on there. Uh, but even if you aren't, they are going to be released one a week. 
uh, until all four are out and available to the public. So, because we want people to listen to things that Nathan spent lots of time editing. Yeah, I spent time editing them, and also yeah, it was like three years ago that I did it, and I'm like, you know what? <laughs> I don't want this to just end up lost to the to the ages. Um, it was it was a fun one shot, and uh, I I did try to do a little bit of production value in it. So pop over there, uh, check it out, see some of the exclusive stuff that we do. Sometimes we'll have just like a little. Uh, piece that we do that isn't really for the episode and we'll pop that as a little separate thing up over there check that out and also you can check us out on the social media networks uh i can be found on twitter at citanium i can be found at exp limited and the show can be found at delve podcast and if you want to find anything more about delve you you want to subscribe and get the episodes as soon as they release we are on every podcast app known to man which includes iheart radio spotify apple uh music i guess is what they're calling it now it's itunes folks it's itunes yeah apple, <laughs> google apple play podcast, i think is what it is i think it's apple podcast now but let's face it people still refer to it as itunes right sure. I, I don't know don't use it people are probably listening to spotify Joe Rogan is exclusive over there, so apparently that's like the new platform. Spotify has become the mixer of podcasts. <laughs> Just like Mixer stole all the like the big uh, Twitch streamers away from the Twitch platform. <laughs> uh, Spotify's doing that for podcasts now, so hey, thanks for tuning in on that platform for us. I appreciate it. Better than if you did it on Luminary. Sorry, did I say that? Anyway, very happy that you were able to join us here today. And, of course, thank you to our shiny little patrons, Bonnie Ainsworth and Nick. Thank you for uh, supporting us. Don't forget the honorary shiny uh, Drunk Paul. Yep, and also Drunk Paul for helping us get to level one on our uh, Discord server. For everybody out there, thank you for joining us on this, uh, which I feel is sort of the lost mechanic of the internet delve <laughs> you're gonna say ask jeeves yes ask jeeves oh did you ever see that video i did where i i uh answered questions about other nathans that was I, a... I don't remember okay that was a video i did and i decided that i would i would do it based on the suggestions of ask jeeves it turns out uh one uh every question that they came up with was uh has nathan ainsworth died and uh, then the other thing is, it's not Ask Jeeves anymore, it's just Ask. Yeah, it's been Ask.com for years. Yeah. I don't know what Jeeves did wrong to piss people off. Or whatever. <laughs> it was probably too long for you to fucking spell. <laughs> that, that must be what it is. If it's more than six characters, we don't want it. Boo. That's why Google had to, like, cut it off at six. And Yahoo cut it off at five. They're like, yeah. No more. Facebook. How did they get away with eight? Damn. It's not a search engine. That's true. That's true. Social media networks can get away with a lot more. That's why there's an Instagram. Yeah. <laughs> Which is just IG. Anyways. Yeah, no, it's IG. Anyway, uh, thank you for joining us on Dulv. Uh, and we will see you on the next episode. Bye, everybody. Bye.